Good evening, you're very welcome. Um, we might just kick off now. I think everybody's uh, logged in online and we've got good attendance here tonight. So my name is Donald Millock. I'm the chairman of the Roads and Transport Society. Uh, delighted you could all make us uh, make, a, make it here tonight to join us for this uh, very interesting presentation by my uh, Transport Infrastructure Ireland colleague, Kieran Brown. Um, delighted that Kieran has agreed to present on this particular topic. It's very, very interesting and very pertinent project in the context of, of the, uh, Dublin City. Um, just to give an introduction or a, a bio on, on Kieran. Kieran is a, a chartered engineer since 2007, qualifying from UCD with a B in civil engineering in 1990. Uh, over 20 years in the rail, uh, heavy and light rail sectors in Ireland, mainly in the delivery of large infrastructural projects. Um, would have started off initially in the RPA, uh, now working with Transport Infrastructure Ireland. He started off in the RPA in 2006 as a senior contracts manager, working on three previous Lewis extensions, uh, Lewis Docklands, Lewis Cherrywood and Lewis Sagart. Uh, his current position is the TIA project manager for the Lewis Cross City. He's a diploma in arbitration from UCD and currently in the final year of an MSc in construction informatics course at DIT. Um, in fairness, uh, I mean, this is a very, very, uh, as I said, a very significant project. It's a fundamental component of Dublin's transportation solution. And uh, it's, I suppose it's a nice follow on from our previous presentations where we had the NTA in outlining the, the Greater Dublin Area Strategy. And also, I think it's a nice follow on to, to how it under, underpins other activities going on in the Greater Dublin Area, such as the, the Master Plan and the, and, and the presentation given by Eamon O'Reilly recently. And I suppose from a TII perspective, it's a, it's a fundamental component of our construction program that we have ongoing in parallel with uh, other significant projects, such as the Enniscorty Bypass, New Ross Bypass, and the N17 and 18 PPP scheme. So uh, I just call upon Kieran to give the presentation now. I mean, generally, it'll be about 45 minutes of presentation. We might do some questions and answers at the end, and then we'll just wrap up, OK? So thanks, Kieran. Thanks very much, John. Um, yeah, good evening. Thanks very much for, for coming. Um, uh, Donald mentioned there about 45 minutes. I haven't timed this presentation, so if I'm going on too long, I, I'll ask Donald to kick me off. But if, uh, it might be too short as well, so I just don't know. I, I put this together. And I suppose the idea of putting it together, really, was just to give, um, as, as it, the title says, an overview, really. So um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll try and touch on the main points to do with Lewis Cross City. And um, if, you've any, if I leave anything out or if I don't kind of uh, emphasize one part or another that you're interested in, just at, at the end, feel free to ask any questions at all. As I say, I, I pitched it as a kind of an overview level, but if there's any detail you want to be, uh, you, you want to ask about, feel free to ask, as I said. So uh, as I say, the, the idea of the lecture really is just an overview. So why are we building it? What are we building? Uh, how and what are the key issues involved? So what's the background, what works are we doing, what are the key issues, and where have we got to so far with the project. So that's really what I really want to talk about tonight. And uh, as I said, I, I've got a fairly high level, um, and, and there's plenty of detail, as you can imagine, on, on, on all sorts of things uh, that I could go into. But I, I, I'll, uh, I'll say I'll leave the questions until the end, and we, we, can, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about at the end. So really, just uh, following on from Donald's point there, um, the, the, the kind of the why part of the question there is why, why are we building Lewis Cross City? What I've done here is I've just taken a couple of extracts from the, uh, the draft transport NTA's draft transportation strategies and I suppose at the outset I suppose I, I have to say as well that the, the obviously the Lewis Cross City scheme is sanctioned by the National Transport Authority so the funding comes through the National Transport Authority for, the, for this job and then TII are actually the sponsoring agency um, it's a bit different from the roads uh, side of things but but in, in, in relation to uh, the, the, uh, uh, this particular job. So the NTA, as I say, uh, as part of their draft transport strategies, both for 2011 to 2030 and for the 2016 to 2035 one, have included Lewis Cross City as, as, as one of the projects that they want to see rolled out. Um, so just looking at where it sits, this, this is an extract from the NTA, from the draft transport strategy 2016 to 2035, and it shows the 2035 um, aspirational kind of map of, of, of rail, light rail in the, in the, in the city. So, um, as most people are aware, the, the Lewis Red Line is all built, and uh, I forgot the piece sticking in the Calibus, so that is built as well, obviously. Then we've got the Lewis Green Line that runs out as far as uh, Carrick Mines, uh, or, or out as far as Cherrywood at the moment. And then Lewis Cross City um, 
what it does is it, it builds in the link between the green and the red line. Uh, it's an ex effectively Lewis cross is an extension to the green line. And what we're doing is we're 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 we're, we're, come, we're bringing the, the Lewis <coughs> across the city so that there's an interconnectivity uh, at O'Connell Street and Marlborough Street, and then we're extending the green up into Cabra. So uh, this this part here up here is Broombridge. So uh, so that. That uh, that basically is 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 the is the part of the scheme that of the Lewis uh, future network that we're that we're rolling out under this project. Um, there's also um, sorry, maybe a minute. Of, oh yeah. Um, just just for completeness, there just added in the the other Lewises that are part of the uh, of of the overall strategy as well. So there's a a Lewis Finglas that's supposed to extend out from Lewis Cross City. Lewis Lucan out to the west of the city, Lewis Poolbeg and, and Lewis Bray as well. So they're all part of the, of the uh, light rail network. But as I say, what I want to talk about this evening is, is, is Lewis Cross City. So um, the I suppose just to finish off on the point of why do we need it, really um, the, the main reason, um, in, in terms of the business case for Lewis Cross City, and obviously all these projects now, you know, they get appraised under certain headings and stuff like that. So when, we, when, the, when Lewis Cross City was getting appraised for its benefits, um, just for, on a numbers type of thing, the benefit cost ratio was calculated at 2.24 to 1. So uh, there was a, a, a very strong uh, benefit to cost ratio for, for the job. In terms of, um, and, and I suppose that economy, that, where, where that kind of figure came from, was was because of the improvement on public transport journey times in, in the city and the inter in, and the reduction in interchange as well between public transport uh, uh, you know modes and then in terms of um, the other appraisal headings there's other appraisal headings safety and environment it was pretty much uh, slightly positive in those fronts in terms of accessibility though it came across in, in, in accessibility terms it really improved accessibility for especially for 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 uh, for groups in the city, it, it really helped them with, with uh, obviously accessibility and stuff like that. And then really just in terms of integration of transport, it really scored highly on that front as well. So, so the benefits really um, were, were you know, seen as quite big, especially in, in, in e economic, economic integration, accessibility, those kind of headings, it really scored highly in terms of benefits. So, um, as I said, it, it got the go ahead, and it, we, we got a railway order in 2012 to go ahead with it. And um, so uh, in 2012, we, we started work on it. So, what, what does Lewis Cross City really involve? Well, as I said earlier, it's an extension of the Lewis Green Line. And starting on the left here, you can see um, we, we have the St. Stephen's Green. So, the existing stop at St. Stephen's Green will get extended about 10 metres towards Grafton Street. So at that end of, of, of uh, St. Stephen's Green stop will get extended. Um, then what happens is that uh, the, the, the Lewis will come around into St. Stephen's Green North, go down Dawson Street, along Westmoreland Street. It, I say there's an interchange with the, with the red line at O'Connell Street at GPO. Then we go O'Connell Street Upper. This is all in the northbound direction. Oh, Dominic Street, and then we go into the railway cutting around Broadstone, the old uh, railway cutting, and then we go on out to Broombridge, and then coming in the southbound direction, we come back the same way, but at the top of O'Connell Street, we come down onto Parnell Street, into Marlborough Street, across the new public transport bridge, the Rosie Hackett Bridge, on the, uh, across the Liffey, and around by Trinity, and then we join back up with the northbound track, just in front of Trinity Gates, pretty much there in College Green. So this is an aerial map which might uh, help people uh, get their bearings even better. So as I said, we, we start at St. Stephen's Green, and, and this you can see the route here I've just described, and we head out. Um, at this point here, this is the point where we leave the on-street section, and we go out into, into the railway cutting area. And for those of you who are interested in the history of railways and things like that, this is, uh, this is the old Broadstone Midland Great Western Railway here at Broadstone. And you can see here that um, we're taking advantage of the, uh, the fact that the old railway cutting is still there out towards, out towards Broombridge. So the, uh, we, 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 we go through the existing uh, bus air and Broadstone Yard at this area here, and then we go into the old railway cutting and off out. Um, 
just uh, as you can see there at the bottom, the total root length from from Stevens Green as far as uh, as, as far as uh, Broom Bridge is 5.6 kilometres. Um, this marks about the halfway point. So at about here, we're about at 2.7, 2.8 kilometres. So we've got about 2.7, 2.8 kilometres of on-street uh, section, and then we've got uh, the, the rest run, runs in the railway cutting. And as I said, I've, I've got the um, the figure the figure here. So the 5.2 embedded track in the city centre, and then uh, we've 2.1 of of stabling up at the depot here, and then six kilometres of off-street running. So that's that's six kilometres of single track equipment. So it's about three kilometres. Um, just in relation to the uh, to the depot itself, as I say, we've got enough stabling. We're, we're building up at Broom Bridge, and we'll have enough stabling up in Broom Bridge for about 17 trams. So that that's the 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 idea is that on the green line, then we'll have a we'll have a depot at the existing depot at Sandyford, and then we'll also have another depot at uh, at um, at Broome Bridge as well to accommodate all the all the trams that we need to to accommodate. Um, so just looking at how how we went about. So we've seen kind of an overview there. Now we've to we've to build about thirteen kilometres of, of of track through the city centre and up in the railway cutting. So I suppose this this is kind of how we went about it in the, at a very very high level. Um, so just just on on the on this graphic over here. We started off with utility works, heritage works, cellar works. I'll describe those in a minute, and then we're, we moved into the track laying phase. With the idea being that uh, we'll have um, Lewis operations eventually, obviously. But um, so, in terms of the uh, where we are at the moment, I'll come on to that later on. But we're in the track laying phase. So um, we, the in the city centre areas, I suppose we we built on lessons learned from the previous Lewis lines. So the previous Lewis lines that we built in the city centre being the original red and green lines, Lewis Docklands as well. So we, we, had, we had gained a lot of experience and a lot of understanding of how or the pitfalls in, in laying Lewis tracks in the city centre from the original red and green lines, um, both in contractual terms and both in, in actual engineering terms as well. So what we did was um, we, set up, um, we set up the enabling works to try and overcome some of those issues, and I'll come on to those in a minute. And... Um, so these enabling works were predominantly in the city centre areas. Um, we kind of left the railway cutting alone until we, uh, until we had to go up there. So in terms of what each of those enabling works in, in, entailed, um, in the city centre area, we, um, there's, there's, a, there's a few items of heritage value that were identified during our environmental impact uh, study for Lewis Cross City. And what it was decided to do was actually in certain, in, 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 in the case of the items that you see here, and I'll describe them in a sec, um, we, we've decided to actually take those down and remove them into storage. So all of those items there, except for Molly Malone, which turned out to get moved, but um, we, we, we've actually taken all of those items off the street to prevent them getting damaged during the course of the works. So just to go through them one by one, this is the, the Lady Grattan Fountain, and it's at the, it was at the junction of St. Stephen's Green and Dawson Street, so that's Dawson Street heading off down that direction there. And so this is called the Lady Grattan Fountain here. So I, I say that that down. The Molly Malone statue was was moved from her position on Grafton Street over to a position on Andrew Street, which is just where the old tourist office was there. Not sure if it's still there. I don't. I think it's closed now. But over on Andrew Street, we, we've moved it over to there as well. And it's actually proven to be quite a success over there because um, it was causing a lot of pedestrian. Um, kind of interference where it was because a lot of people were stopping and there was groups of people getting their photographs taken and stuff like that. So actually I think Dublin City Council are actually that it moved over to uh, Andrew Street because um, there's a lot more room over there, there's a lot more kind of space around it and stuff like that as well. Plus there weren't too many fans of it either in, in Dublin City Council. But uh, this was the Thomas More statue uh, as well and this is located um, at the junction of College Street and College Green. So again this is down and, and removed. The Father Matthew statue from O'Connell Street has been, has been removed and this monument here is, um, it was actually erected for the, uh, the 1988 um, you know, uh, millennium uh, uh, in Dublin. Um, so I think it's, ca it's called a Stein monument anyway and it's, it's, a, it's a Viking, it's, it's a uh, Viking monument. Um, so 
in relation to just just in terms of just I just I put up this graphic here just to kind of show the level of detail that was gone into in order to satisfy the owners of these statues because obviously TII don't own any of these statues we have to make sure that we bind them for the owners and in, in the case of the Father Matthew statue, the Father Matthew statue is actually owned by Dublin City Council so um, in the case of these what we did was we, we carried out uh, a number of surveys so obviously a photographic survey we've got um, a, a level survey and stuff like that and we actually did a 3D as well of it as well and the idea of these surveys was number one to get the c existing condition of it and number two, what, the reason that we did these condition surveys as well was so that with, w in, in, in conjunction with the owner, we're actually carrying out some repair works to these statues while they're actually off the street as well. So the idea was as well to identify whether there was any cracks in them or anything like that that, that needed to be, um, that needs to be uh, sorted out. So we, we have surveys like this for all of our statues and all of the statues, as I say, have been taken off the storage and are either getting repaired or they've just been held in storage un until the, the, the works are completed in those areas and then we put th we'll be putting them back. Um, the other thing that we did as well, and just the kind of thing that people might not be aware that, that we, we do as well, but ju just in, especially in the city centre areas as well, is that we undertook preconditioned surveys of, of um, any of the buildings that were facing out onto our Lewis works that were within a particular, you know, um, a distance away from our Lewis works, we, 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 did, uh, we did surveys as well. So you can see here, this is an example from 28 Westmoreland Street. So again, we did very detailed um, uh, photographic records of existing buildings and stuff like this. And really it's just to protect TII from, from claims of damage and stuff like that as well. But it's also to protect the owners in, in, in relation to, you know, if damage does occur, there's a photographic record that both parties are agreed on as well. It was, it was the precondition of the building as well. Um, in, in the case of some buildings, uh, we've actually done internal surveys of them as well. This is one just that just shows an external survey, as I say. So, so that was just a, just a kind of an element that we, we, we went through the process. We're also doing, also doing interim service between, between contracts. So when, for example, when the enabling work's finished, we did another survey after the enabling work's finished and before the track work started as well. So, so we, we've been doing interim surveys as well on things. Um, in relation to the cellar works, um, going back to the original green line, um, there's a lot of horror stories told about Harcourt Street, which are, most of them aren't true. But anyway, one of the things that did occur during the original green line was that during the utility diversion works stage of, of the original Lewis green line, um, there were the, the contractor encountered that were uncharted cellars, so nobody knew they were there. Even the property owners didn't know these cellars were, were extending out under the footpaths and into the street. And what, what happened was it led to a lot of delays with the utility works, um, because obviously until, until such time as there was an agreement with the property owner about what was going to happen to their cellar, and uh, until a, design, a, a new design was developed for, for the, for the uh, utility and stuff like that, it all took time. So all delays were building up and building up. So what we, did, what we decided to do as part of Lewis Cross City was we decided to do a, an advance package purely looking at sellers and trying to locate any uncharted sellers that might either interfere with our utility works or might interfere with our track works. And so what you see there, the images that I've shown you there are, what we did was we actually did linear slit trenches either in the footpath or just on the road just to try and pick up where any existing sellers were and as I say, I mean, we, we, um, we, we did the, 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 the condition service that I showed you earlier. Um, part of those condition surveys was to establish whether there's any sellers in the buildings. And as part of those condition surveys, we found about 25, maybe 27 sellers that you could get down in and actually go into. So we were able to identify that there was 27 sellers at least that we had to. But we concluded the sellers work contract we'd actually found 330 of these of these types of, of sellers here so uh, 330 actual individual sellers some some buildings had three or four of these themselves like so there was actually individual code and what they were generally used for was actually to deliver again historically speaking they were used for the delivery of coal to buildings so what you might notice if you walk down any city center streets in Dublin is you, you'll see a, a, a maybe a a 300 mil round uh, steel plate in the ground 
and they're generally covering they were generally covering coal holes. and the idea was that instead of bringing coal in through the house you, you coal into the cellar so it's in here and then they just bring it up through the house so um, the, the, these coal holes date back to obviously to the to the to the Georgian times when, when some of these buildings were built so as I said what we did was we we dug slit trenches we 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 do, took um, an architectural we we, we had um, architectural heritage people on, on board as well. We took a record of the cellars as well. And where there was a coal hole, what we did was we actually, we would block up the cellar from the building side. Um, and 99 times out of 100, we had the permission of the building owners to go into their building to do that. So we, we, we'd block up the cellar from this side just using concrete block wall. And then what we do is we'd fill the cellar with a very low strength grout material. So it was like less than 10 kilonewtons per meter. You know, it was, it was a very low strength grout, actually down as far, actually it was down to two, I think we had a two kilonewtons uh, a strength. The idea being obviously when we came through with our utilities that we didn't want to be digging through 30 newton concrete, so we want to be digging through something that was fairly, uh, fairly easy to dig through. So it was a very, very, very lean, like it was, it was, a, it was a, but it was a, it was a flowable fill as well, so the idea being that we, we, we would fill in the, the full structure of the, of the cellar because the idea being is that when we came through with our utilities, say we came through our, with our utilities towards the top here, we wanted to make sure that there was no voids underneath as well. So, so it was a very flowable mix that we put in. In the cases where there wasn't a coal hole, we just exposed the, uh, the roof of the cellar and, and we, we poured the, the, the material in there. So as I said, at the end of the seller's contract then, we had reasonable confidence that, confidence that we'd picked up as many of the sellers as we possibly could and thereby, you know, um, trying to mitigate the risk of, of coming across such sellers during our utility diversion works. Um, the other thing as well, this is a very, very simplified, this, like we, we, we took as built records, as I, I mentioned that earlier that we had people on board, but like this is simplified. The, the, the as built records we have are actually very, very detailed, but this is just to show kind of an example of, of what kind of seller. So, so um, we, we, uh, we, we did, this is a very simplified thing that we gave to the property owner as well to say this is what we've done to your cellar uh, and, uh, but we have uh, much, mo much more detailed records than those. Which brings me on to the, I suppose, the biggest element of our enabling works really which was the, um, the utility diversion works and by the way, you can tell by the way I'm talking about the, these things being in the past finished now, so the heritage works, the first phase of the heritage works is now complete, everything that needs to be off the street from a heritage value point of view is gone. Um, all the sellers now, 130 sellers that we filled in, that contract is now finished as well. And the utility diversions works finished uh, just late last year. So we just, we just um, issued a certificate for substantial completion in December of this year, of last year for uh, the utility works. Um, and you'll notice as well, actually, people, uh, it's, it's the, I've, I've mentioned the contractor's name up here. I'm sorry. Uh, the contractor's name. Uh, McCluskey's did this one, and KN Networks were the contractors for the sellers' works and the heritage work. Or so, um, so Jerry McCluskey Utilities were the people for this. Again, I, I, I mentioned earlier about lessons learned from previous Lewis lines. Um, one of the big difficulties that we faced into when we were planning these works, apart from the whole engineering side of things as well, which I'll come on to as well, but apart from the whole engineering side of things as well, was contractually speaking, trying to set up a contract to do 70 kilometres of new ducting and pipe work in the city centre under a fixed price lump sum project uh, under was, was uh, it was, uh, we're on a hide to nothing try, trying to do it. So what we did was um, we spoke to um, a member of the, well, we spoke to the, the government uh, procurement committee, the GCCC committee, about um, being allowed to maybe uh, use a different form of contract. So what we did was we, we, we settled on using the NEC uh, target cost type contract for, for, for these works here. And um, it, it, it's, not, it's not commonly used contract as well. I mean, a lot of people who've worked in the UK, I'm, I'm sure, are, are familiar with it. But um, just from the point of view of, for this type of work, it was actually absolutely ideal. Because basically what it is, it's, it's, it's a cost reimbursable type contract. So the contractor gets paid their costs, but it's at, it's, it, there's a target that they have to achieve, that they, they, can't, they can't go beyond the target. Now the target can move by compensation events, so if you, if you descope work, the target comes down, <coughs> and if, you, if there's compensation events, the target goes up. But the, the beauty of it is, from, from, from our point of view, 
was we had full visibility of the contractor's costs. So it was an open book contract. So we could go in. So whenever there was an additional piece of work being, being requested or whenever an additional, whenever something came up that was a compensation event, we could actually go in and actually look at the contractor's books in terms of the price. So what it, what it gave us is that often with a lot of these contracts, the, the outturn price compared to the tender sum is a lot higher. You know, the, the outturn price ends up a lot higher. And if, if you don't have that open book accounting system, you don't have the visibility of the, d of the delta between X and Y. So under the NEC form of contract, at least we had the comfort, even though it went from X to Y, with the comfort of seeing, you know, all the and, and we, we, we were able to, it, it gave um, the NTA as well, who are our sanctioning authority, who had to sanction the funding as well and stuff like that, the comfort that they weren't, you know, overpaying or whatever, you know. So it's, I say it worked out well for us, but I suppose like any contract, I suppose, you know, it, it can be abused as well. But in the case of McCluskey's and ourselves, I suppose both parties went into it very positively and I think it worked out very, very well. And I think in, if there is a future Lewis lines being built, I think we probably follow that model again. Um, just in relation to the actual technical works themselves, I suppose the way the way we do our utility works, and, and I suppose this, this uh, spaghetti junction here on this side of things is, is uh, kind of shows you, um, I suppose, the complexity involved. But at once you get used to it, you, you, you know, you kind of get used to reading these things, you can make them out. But basically, th the, way, the way that we do our utility diversions, and, and it's the way we've done it on previous Lewis lines as well, technically speaking, is that we get all the uh, records in from all of the utility owners. Uh, so your ESB and Dublin City Council, etc., Aircom, all those guys, we, we get all their records in. And what we do then is we go out and we radar map the city. So we go out, radar map every, every square inch of the streets that we're going through. And what the utility design guys try to do is they try and match up what's on the record drawings because the ro record, an awful lot of the record drawings are simply schematics or they're just to give an idea to the utility company what side of the street their utility is on. It's not actually to say it's, you know, two meters out from the building. But um, using kind of manhole covers and you know chamber lids and all that sort of stuff, all that kind of photographic evidence, all that radar mapping, we try and match up what we see on the street with what's on their drawings. Now there's not, the, 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 so by the end of that process, we end up with, with something that looks like this here. And then what we do, so the, thin, the thinner lines would be the existing utilities. I'm, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail. So that, that could be a kind of a talk in itself. But, um, the ticker lines then, what, what the utility designer guys do is they build the ticker lines in are the new infrastructure for the utility company. So what you're looking at there is actually the, tick, the ticker line <laughs> would be the, the new stuff and the thinner lines then would be the existing. And obviously they have to thread their way through the existing because the existing has to stay live while, the, while we're putting in the new stuff as well. So, so that's how the design happens. And then generally speaking what happens is that when we appoint our contractor, we build all the new infrastructure. So we, we, we put in all the ducts for ESB, for Aircom, for BT, Colt, all those comms companies. We put in the, the, we put in the ducts for Dublin City Council Fibre. We put in the, air, the uh, ESB ducts. We put in uh, dra new drainage manholes. We do, what, we do all that sort of stuff. And then what we do is we leave the connection of the, the disconnection of the old system and the reconnection of the new system up to the utility owner. So, for example, we would never pull, we don't pull aircom cables or anything like that. We simply provide the chambers and ducts for aircom. Then aircom come out, they pull their new cables into the new ducts, and then back at wherever the join in point between the old and new is, they, they switch across. So, that, so that's the way the utility diversions work. So, um, I suppose it just, it just can, it can lead to a bit of confusion as well at times when we call it utility diversions <laughs> because people think that we're actually. But we, we, we simply provide the, the, the infrastructure for the utility owner. That, that's what we tend to do. So those works there took, took us about um, from o October 2013 until, as I said, about December 2015. So it took us about two years to do all the utility diversion works. And included in that, um, as I said, was w one, of the, one of the things I suppose I just highlighted there as well, which is the, uh, the sewer relining. Um, this is... Uh, of a sewer and part of our agreement with Dublin City Council before we built the, the Lewis Cross City was that um, the, like the design life of Lewis Cross City is a hundred years, it's hundred years yeah, <laughs> um, 
the design life of Lewis Cross City is, is 100 years. And uh, so a lot of these sewers are, you know, 100 years old or whatever they are. So what Dublin City Council said is that building your Lewis line over our sewer, we're not going to get a chance to strengthen that sewer again for, you know, uh, for a long, long time. So even if the sewer is in good condition, what we want you to do is we want you to reline the sewer. So that was part of our agreement with Dublin City Council. So we ended up doing about two kilometres of sewer reline centre as part of the Lewis job and again it was McCloskey's that did that as well <coughs> and what we also did was we built about 50 try to see if I, um, this is a this is an example here we built about 50 new manholes as well on the existing sewer system as well and the right the reason mo the reason why we had to build new manholes in most cases was because the existing manhole is too close is too close to our Lewis line so in order for them, for, for Dublin City Council, or Irish Water in this case now, in order for our Irish Water to be able to gain access to their sewers in the future, we've had to build new manhole access on the sewer offline, uh, away from the Lewis line. So say we, uh, as part of the utility diversion works, we also built about 50 number uh, deep drainage manholes. And then obviously we had a lot of building service connections and stuff like that. And the, again, there was a lot of interaction with building owners in relation to building service connections. And you can imagine in the city centre as well, where you have coffee shops and restaurants all um, relying on water supply. Doing the switch over to water supplies as well was, was, uh, was, uh, was uh, tricky at times. So we tend to do it out of hours or whatever time that suited them. Um, as a result, I suppose, of the utility works, um, we, with, with our as builds and stuff like that, we were able to kind of uh, map um, what the new, what the new utilities, where the new utilities were, and this is actually an extract from um, from uh, our, our track designers' designs. And what, so, I suppose what the, the the point to show in this is that because we had done our utility works, we knew where all the new utilities were, and we we had a very good idea where all the existing utilities were as well. So we were able to actually put them on top of where the track. So as part of our track design, we were able to map where the existing utilities were. So when it came to actually, uh, you know, for traffic chambers and stuff like that, we were able to, uh, um, we were able to, to, to uh, kind of space-proof those as part of our works. So, <coughs> moving on to the, the main infrastructure works, um, I suppose just, just, just to give you an idea of what's involved in the main infrastructure works, um, the, the the contractor is a, is a joint venture of uh, CISC, who everybody knows, and Staconfer, who are a Portuguese rail company. Uh, they're, they're, they're rail specialists, and they actually worked on, on, on the previous extensions as well um, under, uh, as, as subcontractors. But, uh, so, so they're the uh, joint venture who are doing these works. The, uh, the, the works involved, as, as, as the list says there, is HV and LV ducting. Um, actually, somebody commented to me there about the number of HV and LV see in the city centre at the moment. There, yeah, we're, we're putting in about we're putting in 10 uh, 125 mil ducts for HV and 10 125 mil ducts for LV underneath our track. So we're actually the ducts underneath our track alignment uh, around the city. Um, a lot of those, uh, like about I'd say 60 percent, 70 percent of those are going to be used now. And then there's uh, some left over for future provision and for provision for Dublin City Council as well. Dublin City Council uh, run a fibre network around the city as well. So they've uh, part of our uh, arrangements with Dublin City Council are that they, they'll get a duct or two as well on, uh, in the LV duct bank. <coughs> um, in terms of track installation, there's ballasted track. The ballasted track, as people could imagine, is mainly up in the railway cutting. And then the embedded rails are in the city centre section. So in terms of ballasted track, the depot area uh, that the, 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 the figures I gave you earlier on for the depot area and the, uh, and, and the cutting, that's ballasted track. And then the embedded rails is in around two and a half, three kilometres of embedded rail in the city centre. Um, in relation to the structural works, we've got, um, we're building... Um, We've built. We've already built one bridge. Uh, we're building. We're building another bridge at Broadstone. I'll show. There's a picture of it now in a second. And um, uh, we 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 also have. Uh, we're doing some um, 
<laughs> some, some upgrade works to existing bridges on North Circular Road and Cabra Road bridges as well. Um, we're also building a, a new footbridge out at Broome Bridge as well over the heavy rail line. So again, um, if, you, if you're traveling in from Maynooth or, the, or the, the west of the city on the, on the heavy rail line, you'll be able to get off at Broome Bridge Station, walk over the footbridge and actually um, land at the Lewis stop, at, the, at the, the terminus stop of Lewis Cross City and you'll be able to come into the city centre. So there's a heavy rail, light rail connection up at Broome Bridge as well. Um, so there's, that's part of our, that's part of our uh, works as well. We're, we're building a depot at Broome Bridge as I mentioned earlier. The stop construction, obviously the 13 stops that I mentioned earlier are part of this contract. Traffic signalling is a major part of this contract. <coughs> We've uh, 30, 31, or 30, 31, 33 junctions um, to, to we've in the city centre as well. And then part of this contract as well is the OCS, the overhead, uh, overhead contact system uh, installation as well is part of this contract as well. So just in relation to just kind of a little bit of a technical part of it, um, just in relation to how the embedded track will look or is looking at the moment, we're, we're using um, a, a kind of a two-pore, uh, three-pore solution. So from here, from here, we've got a, um, a concrete slab. It's a, a CA10 mix um, as a sub-base material. Then we've got the, the concrete slab here. This is the embedded track, obviously. Uh, concrete slab and then the last pour we, we pour the shoulders in here so there's a there's a there's a concrete pour up to the web of the rail and then we pour a, a concrete shoulder as well and there's a retarder, retarder in the shoulder so that we can uh, we can you, uh, give that an exposed aggregate finish as well and then the whatever surfacing in this case it's the it's a road surf it's it's a, it's for shared running but we can also put granite sets in this area here as well and then you've got your uh, your footpath curb is out here. Um, ballasted section, it's very straight, it's very very normal kind of ballasted. So you've got a sub ballast, you've got your ballast layer, and then it's a sleeper based concrete sleeper based system uh, out out in the ballasted section. And obviously you've got your your drainage out here as well. So that's the uh, that there that, that's uh, very high level technical, but that, that that's the uh, that's the layout. And you can see here as well, just as a detail, the the rails are embedded in rubber and that's for for two reasons I suppose um, it's they're, they're, so, uh, part of it is for vibration and stuff like that as well but actually its main function is 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 to stop stray current from leaking out of the of the rail because the because we're an electrified system the return current that goes through the Lewis comes back through the rail back to the substation so uh, it's actually to stop uh, leakage of, of, of current so the 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 rails are fully encapsulated in rubber for that reason, and then as well. Uh, so the so there's a kind of a, a um, what would you say a, 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 a rubber boot that goes around the rail here, and then these two uh, are poured in situ. We, we've got poured in situ uh, kind of uh, rubber rubber blocks there on either on either side. So uh, just moving on. So ju just to again give give you a sense as well of uh, in relation to. Uh, Lewis Cross City is about. Um, what you see down here is, a, is a, an artistic impression of what uh, Broadstone is going to look like when uh, Grange Gorman is built out. This is, this is from uh, GDA's website. But basically, um, <coughs> for those of you familiar with the area, um, this is the Broadstone building up on Constitution Hill and as I mentioned earlier, the railway kind of heads off in that direction. So, and this is the, this is the Broadstone building here. So this, as I said earlier, it, this is the, one of the bridges that we're building as well. And, and this, this bridge will bring buses uh, from Constitution Hill over the Lewis tracks and into Broadstone. So, so the, that, that bridge is under construction at the moment. And uh, the idea being though, that when we finish our works, there'll be a plaza area here, which will, which will act both as a kind of a public realm enhancement for the area, but also it'll actually be the access from uh, from um, Kings Inn, Constitution Hill, Dominic Street area, up into the new Grange Gorman development as well. Um, so so we we we've, uh, we're working closely with the, with Grange Gorman development there to find to uh, agree those designs. We have a reference design. We're just agreeing the detail on it now. And I say that uh, that area then will actually be a I suppose an enhancement for the area from the ground point of view. 
Um, so so that's uh, so we're, that's our integration with the Grange Gorman development. Um, the depot as well, just again, just to give um, these these are parts of the city, I suppose, that aren't that well known. So just just to give you an impression of it as well. So this is our existing situation here. So you have a heavy rail station at Broome Bridge at the moment. These are industrial units over here, and there's an industrial uh, units over here. And they actually you can't see it. I don't think you can see it. the canal. The, um, the 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 Royal Canal runs along here as well. So what we're going to do is th this piece of uh, waste ground here become our depot area. So just to get your bearings. So this is this is the heavy rail station here. And our depot is actually going to be sitting in that that uh, that piece of what was waste ground, but is going to be our depot area as well. And you can just I mentioned there about the, the the footbridge. So there'll be an interchange here between heavy rail and light rail. So as I say, if you're travelling in from Minut on the rail line, you'll be able to get off your train, go over the footbridge, and you're straight down onto our Lewis terminal stop, which is just about here, and then the the Lewis heads off down into O'Connell Street, St Stephen's Green. So uh, that's, uh, I suppose, uh, again, it, it, it's going to kind of, uh, it, it, it's almost like an infill piece of development for, for this particular part of the, of, of the city as well, because what it'll do is it, it'll actually occupy a piece of waste ground that was prone to antisocial behaviour as well, but, uh, it, and, and it, it, it'll, um, it'll serve the, that uh, Cabra area as well in terms of uh, a Lewis stop. Um, just as a detail, I suppose we have a, a set down area here for there, there won't be any parking. This won't be a park and ride. This will be just like a set down area, a kiss and ride type um, uh, facility. So set down area and people go away. There will be parking for for tram drivers and things like that, but and, and maintainers. But uh, it'll it'll be primarily for uh, a set down area. Um, <coughs> So that's kind of like what we're building, and, and, and it's, a, it's a very, very quick overview of what we're building. Um, and I suppose I'm just going to move on. I, I, in, I, in my first slide, I kind of had the why, what, and how. I'm kind of just moving into the how now. And I just really want to touch on two kind of issues, um, two, two main issues that um, if you were building, you know, uh, if you were building Lewis Cross City out in the middle of you know, uh, it'd be fine if have all the technical issues, but we obviously were in the city centre area, so we have to talk about kind of issues, what, you know, how, how we've kind of dealt with those issues. So, um, I say I, I won't dwell too much on this, but just, just to give people a sense of, of how this is working from a TII point of view, um, the, way, the way we've uh, approached traffic management is that we've, we've set up what's called the Lewis Cross City Traffic Forum, and it meets, broadly speaking, monthly. There was a meeting of it today, actually. And um, all those people that are mentioned there, so the NTA, Dublin City Council, ourselves, Dublin Bus, Bussair and, and Garda Siakana attend these monthly meetings. And really it's an opportunity for the contractor to present what they, their phasing plans for the next three to six months. And that, that's the, that's the kind, of, kind of a rolling program of, of looking ahead. Today, for example, we were looking into the summer, we were looking at July, August time. And so so th it's really to the, the people who are kind of uh, decision makers in, in those organisations, the, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the look ahead of, of what the contractor is planning to do. And often what's presented isn't accepted, so he has to go away and think about it again and, and, and come back. So what that then devolves down into is uh, there's a weekly meeting, and this meeting takes place every Thursday morning in our offices. And again, the same, the same groups are, 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 are involved. But this time, the guys on the ground. So it's the local guard inspect, like it's the it's the local sergeants, it's the um, the bus inspectors, it's the roads inspectors from DCC, it's um, um, uh, I suppose, and, and then from ourselves, it's it's actually our site engineers go to this meeting. So so this takes place weekly, and I suppose one of the things as say, as Don mentioned earlier, I, I came from a heavy rail background into RPA in 2006, and one of the very first things that struck me was the we spend talking about traffic in the city centre. We spend, I'd say, we, 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 there's some weeks you spend 50, 60 percent of your time in traffic management, not, not the works themselves. So it's a, it is, it's, a, it's a huge part of what we do. And uh, in fairness to all of the people, and I suppose that's it's kind of a, it's because of the fact that the NTA, I suppose, and, and DCC are, are, are supportive of the project. In fairness, like everybody has been very, 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 you know, people are generally speaking very helpful and try and facilitate our works as, as best as they can. 
and Dublin bus in fairness have been messed about a fair bit by our works as well and they've been very they've been very patient with us uh, in terms of moving bus stops and all that sort of stuff during our works so the the graphic on the left there is really just it's it's it's, it's a sample of what we actually uh, present to the traffic forum and to the weekly traffic groups and that's actually a picture there that's um, that's um, College Green so that's Bank of Ireland that's Trinity College and this is a uh, our work site, our work site, and you know, so so this is what we present to the to the traffic forum, uh, and and to the traffic group for, for for discussion every week, and then once we've gone through those two phases, the, the contractor then makes the uh, application to Dublin City Co Dublin City Council's road risk control unit. So once we've gone through these two steps, then we 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 make the contractor makes the application, and then lo and behold, you get it on the street. So the so, um, I say it, put, it takes an awful lot of time and effort because, like, obviously the, the contractor is trying to phase their works in a certain way. Obviously, they're trying to do it as productively as possible and stuff like that. But uh, traffic management is a key. It's a key key issue for Lewis Cross City, and um, it's it's something that, as I say, it takes up a lot of time. But it's in, in fairness, I think the the idea, I suppose, of keeping the city, city flowing is one of our fundamental. One of, one of our fundamental objectives throughout Lewis Cross City is to keep the city open and, and moving uh, throughout the works. The other issue that I just want to highlight as well is that because we're in the city centre uh, and because of, the, um, because of the fact that, like, obviously we're, we're, we're causing disruption to a lot of uh, and residents and, you know, all, all those sorts of groups, communications has, we, we, we have a, a dedicated communications team of about six or seven people um, and they're based in, uh, if you want to call it, they're actually based just off Dawson Street there in, in the Royal Hibernian Way. Um, and it's a public information office and stuff like that as well. But generally speaking, the, the, key, the key things that we do on, on, a, on, a, on a weekly, daily, monthly basis are, are listed there on, on the left-hand side of, of the slide. So we have some, some examples of, of, the, uh, of the advertising campaigns that we've done is that uh, the College Green bus gate got extended from morning and evening peak to a 12 hour uh, bus gate there uh, a while ago, I think it was last year, uh, might have been even the year before actually, but uh, we, when, when we did it, uh, we, we, we did a big you know, media campaign and we, we, it was really to get the message out there to, to the public because most people who are commuting and stuff like that, you know, they, they don't really pay too much attention to all these kind of press ads and stuff like that. So to go big, like if we're making a big change in the city centre, we have to go very, very big with it. Um, one of our current ones here is this one here, is Cycling Aware. Um, the reason being, I suppose, that um, while people are used to where the tracks are for the red and green lines, because been, they've been there for about 10, over 10 years now, um, obviously we're introducing new bits of track in the city centre, and um, we, 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 we put up these cycling advisories. But as well as putting up cycle advisories locally as well, we've actually gone out into Twitter and Facebook and all those sorts of things, and we, we've run a kind of an ad campaign, and actually we did, a, we did a radio campaign as well about, you know, that there's new rails going to appear in the city as well, all with, the, with, you know, with a safety message in mind that uh, cyclists, you know, to be aware, just to be aware that, that, that there are tracks, uh, that there are new tracks appearing in the streets, and just to be aware of those. Um, one of the key things that I would like to highlight here as well is, is these guys. We've got three local liaison officers that actually literally walk, you know, from street, you know, they, they have their areas, but they literally know each shop owner, they know everybody behind the you know, all those sorts of people. And they're the people for, if you're moving a loading bay, if you're putting a bus stop outside them, if you're going to be doing works next Thursday, these are the guys that actually go out and they actually talk to all these people all the time. So every Friday morning I sit down with them, I sit down with the site engineers and we go through the plan of what's coming up for the next two or three weeks and these guys go out the locally and they go out and they spread the message locally to everybody so they did, and, and if, if needs be we print off flyers just you know for if there's going to be a, a change in you know delivery routes and stuff like that so we do, do all that sort of stuff. So this, 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 I think this um, measure has actually taken a lot of uh, a, lo a, a, a lot of heat um, off of the, the the project as well in terms of dealing with because as I say as soon as we know that there's going to be a change to uh, somebody's uh, 
and, and sorry, the local liaison people as well, say in Cabra, for example, it's much more residential. So they're dealing with residential issues like noise and I have rats in my back garden, all those sorts of things. They, these, these guys, they just kill those issues within a day or two, they're sorted and they never really get any momentum, which it's, it's, it's a great, great help. The other thing that we do as well is we do some sponsorships as well. So, so around Christmas time, for example, we, we, we sponsored local, um, um, you know, um, active elderly clubs and stuff like that as well. And then Dublin Town, who are a representative organisation for the, for the retailers, they represent about 2,500 uh, businesses in the city centre. They run events in the city centre as well, and we, we, we support those as well. Because Dub Dublin Town's big message is, is this thing here, Dublin is great, business as usual. That's their message that they're trying to get out there. So we, we try and support that message as well. Because one of the concerns before Lewis Cross City ever started was that the city was going to shut down and grind to a halt. And we're trying to obviously uh, prevent that message from becoming any sort of a reality at all. Uh, just in terms of timeline and stuff like that, so we're moving on now to the progress so far. So in my why, who, what one, um, this, this is where we are. Where have we got to now? So this, this, this is a timeline here. I don't know if you can read it. Um, but this is 2013, 2014, and so on up to 2017. So as I mentioned earlier, the heritage and the cellar infill works. The first stage, the heritage is finished, and the cellar infill works is fully finished. And the utility diversion works there are finished as well. They kind of moved on into a little bit into the fourth quarter, 2016, or 2014, 15. We're on this line here now. So where are we? We're, 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 we're currently in the main infrastructure works. We see the main infrastructure works continuing into about the third or fourth quarter of 2017 in parallel with the systems works and the, uh, and the uh, testing and, and, and trial running stage as well. So, so in terms of the timeline, so we, we're about here in the first quarter of 2016. So we're right more or less about a third of the way through the uh, infrastructure works and we're going to be starting our systems works in summer this year, pretty much. So, so that's where we're at. Um, just, I suppose, I threw up this graphic as well, just to give people an idea of where we are in the city centre as well. So progress. So at the end of January 2016, on the north side of the city, um, the, the, the key is here. So, 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 twin track. So, so these are the sites that we had set up in the city centre. So again, just to get your bearings, this is Upper Dominic Street, Lower Dominic Street. Here's Parnell Street here and O'Connell Street there and uh, Marlborough Street over here. So we, we're basically ex either excavate or excavating or installing track in, in a good few of these areas here and uh, we're installing double track in, in this area here as well. So, so that's where we were on the north side at the end of 2016 and then just on the south side then where we were again we're doing our single track installation on Hawkins Street, Westmoreland Street, College Street coming around by Trinity into Nassau Street and uh, we've started excavating now in Dawson. It's ju just after Christmas there we started excavating in Dawson Street and here as well on St. Stephen's Green North uh, we're excavating and actually obviously we're, we're at the end at the start of March now so, so these things have moved on a bit, there's a bit of track laid there now and uh, we're, we were laying track there just on the corner. So as you can see we've pretty much occupied as much of the city as we as as we as we kind of can at the moment, and so in terms of production, we're hoping that by the end of 2016 that we'll have maybe 80 percent or so of the tracks laid in the city centre by the end of this year. Um, there is a moratorium period as well. Um, just I suppose just to touch on it as well, and it's kind of very very apt at the moment because it's just about to start. Um, back when we were putting the contract documents together we were aware obviously that this was 2016 so the centenary of 1916 and um, at, the t at the time that we set up the contracts we weren't sure what kind of uh, restrictions would be placed on our works especially in the O'Connell Street you know the, the, um, the parade route for most parades is kind of along Westmoreland Street across O'Connell Bridge and you know up O'Connell Street or whatever and kind of heads, heads up either Cavendish Row or comes around by Parnell Square so we, we weren't quite sure, so just to be on the safe side, we kind of put um, a hiatus on works in, in those areas into our contract. Now, as it turned out, the hiatus was, was, um, was a little bit longer than it needed to be, so we were able to shorten that period. But anyway, 
So at the moment, if, if people are around the city centre and they're wondering why we're closing up sites, that's the reason. So, um, for, so St. Patrick's Day, obviously, fall on the 17th, and then the, uh, the main Easter commemoration this year centre is on the 27th of March. So from the 17th of March until the 27th of March, and a couple of days either side, we're actually demobilising uh, all of our sites off of those off of the parade route, and indeed we actually have to demobilise some of our sites off of West off of uh, Marlborough Street as well um, <coughs> on, for the Easter commemoration period. There's uh, there's going to be a huge amount of pedestrian movements up and down this street because O'Connell Street is effectively going to be blocked off with stands and things like that. So so um, just if, if people are out and about and they're looking saying they're not finishing this street and they're pulling off that that's why we're, we're, we're pulling off for the parade for the two parades that are coming up in in this month um so just moving on i just i i i i just brought some pictures i, <laughs> I just brought some pictures along uh just 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 so people can have a look and see where we're at again so so again a lot of people obviously don't a lot of people don't work in the city center so a lot of people don't see these things but um and people who are in the city centre will be familiar with seeing things like this. But this is uh, Fusilier's Arch here, St Stephen's Green North, and you know our, our Lewis line is coming around this way. This is the ducting. This is the HVLV ducting that I mentioned earlier on. So there's going to be 20 of these ducts that are travelling along with us along the line. Um, this then again is it, this is uh, Trinity, and this is uh, 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 the Bank of Ireland, uh, uh, College Green. And again, you can see here there that we're, we're that that this is our we're building the southbound track here, coming through. And then on O'Connell Street, there's the spire. And then, and then this, is, this is a piece of track that we've actually poured. And, and actually, we've, we've just demobilized off this piece of track uh, today. Or, uh, it's either today or tomorrow. We're, we're demobilized off O'Connell Street for, uh, for the 12th. So, uh, so this, this piece of track is actually installed now. And is, 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 is we're about to demobilize that site. Um, just coming, just again, kind of in the city centre area, here's a, a piece, this is the Pro Cathedral, this is Marlborough Street, so at the end of January there we're just laying, laying our tracks uh, coming down Marlborough Street, so again, this is the southbound track, uh, Parnell Street is off up there in the distance, and this is the southbound track coming down towards the Rosie Hackett Bridge, uh, well towards the Red Line tie-in as well, of course. Um, again, this is another piece of track that we're putting in, so this is Parnell Street. This is Marlborough Street. So here we are bringing, again, the southbound track around Parnell Street. And you can see there that the, uh, the encapsulation is on. The, uh, these bars here are holding the gauge and, and holding the level and stuff like that as well. So it's just, to just maybe just to give you a little bit of detail on that and just a technical detail as well. These, we use these bars here to hold the gauge, obviously, before we pour the concrete. But we also use them to level the track. So they're, they're, they're treaded bars, so, so the, the, the track goes in and then it gets leveled on these bars here, up and down. And then obviously there's a pre-port survey and then there's a post-port survey as well. Um, and and so, so that's how the track gets leveled and positioned on site. Um, just up in the railway cutting, again, this is a part that most people wouldn't see. What we're looking at here is actually Cabra Road and North Circular Road in the background. Okay, so that's Cabra Road and that's North Circular Road. And this is the old railway cutting. So you can, as you can see, a lot of the earthworks are now done in the railway cutting. And they're just getting ready to put in drainage here. The, the, the drainage isn't, isn't in there yet. So they're just getting ready to put in the drainage. And then uh, the last piece, so I, I mentioned earlier that we'd actually already built a, a, a new bridge. And this is Fossa Road Bridge. So again, uh, just to give, pe get, give people their bearings, as you, uh, as you head north out in, into the railway cutting, um, the, the last bridge that you go under will be, will be Fossa Road Bridge and Cabra Stop will actually be just beyond uh, Fossa Road Bridge here so, so this is up here and what I've done is there um, I did a little time lapse of the building of this bridge as well um, it was one of those things basically what we did was we actually built the bridge offline so we actually uh, we, we, we built um, we, we did this we did the um, we did the substructure works here while the road was still live, this is this this uh, this is Foster Road, and it's a it's a two lane road that goes between Cabra and Fibsbury, and uh, we 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 built the substructure work. We piled down, 
we left the existing bridge in place. So, so there was an old, there obviously there was an old bridge there to carry the road. And uh, so we left the old bridge in place and we actually built new abutments in front of it. And then what we did was we built a superstructure. So we built a superstructure about 20 metres down the railway cutting. And then what we did was we actually moved it into place over, over a couple of days. And uh, so we had, the, we had a road closure for... for Two weeks. We did we did a road coach for about two weeks, but that was uh, in order to move in to move in the bridge. So as I said, I, I actually have a, a uh, if if uh, if you bear with me, I I, I have um, um a, a time lapse on it. So you can see here the uh, the bridge is. Oh, <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. So the bridge, yeah, the bridge is built uh, in the cutting area, and that's the existing bridge there. You see, it's a, a You can see the you can see the substructure that we built underneath it with timber underneath the demolition works there. That that's the substructure that we built beforehand. So this is the transporter that actually transported the bridge uh, from, from point A to point B. See the wing walls already built on this side, on the north side of the bridge. But the, the, the bridge that you can see above you there is actually for pedestrians. We, we maintain ped pedestrian flows across during, during the, for the full uh, road closure. We maintain pedestrian flows there as well. It's just the uh, uh, other wing wall, approach walls getting lifted in now by a crane. You can see the wing walls on, this, on the south side of the bridge now getting, uh, getting poured. And that's the finished article. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for that, Karen. That was a truly excellent presentation. Um, so just throw it up to the floor. Any questions and answers? So we have some microphones there. If anybody has a question, you might just give your name and uh, serial number and shoot ahead. Okay, just one here at the front. Um, thank you, that was a very interesting presentation. Um, I have just one question with regard to filling in the, the cellars. In days gone by, the Dublin United Tramway Company had, I suspect, considerably heavier trams or a heavier axle load, and they went over the cellars. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're asking the wrong person. I, I, I suppose... Um, 
I'm not quite sure what they did for utility diversions. An awful lot of our cellar infill was for the utility diversions stage, if you know what I mean. Um, so, uh, so yeah, in terms of structural, we, we did look at the structural uh, capacity as well issue. And I suppose in most cases, we found that our, our, uh, our tram loads weren't interfering with the cellars, you know, uh, in most cases. And it was, it was actually only really where the actual track slab had to actually, we had to take a piece off the cellar. But generally speaking, if the track slab was outside the cellar zone, we didn't infill the cellars because of that, but generally speaking. Sorry, just a question more for myself from an operations perspective. I was at a, a, a meeting today down in Limerick, and this, the, the issue of tunnel safety directive always comes up from an operations perspective. Um, I just wondered, is, is there an equivalent kind of safety-based legislation that, that, you know, Lewis Cross City has to be mindful of and, um, you know, that you, you also have to continuously monitor and assess? Um, yeah, I suppose um, for, for I before you can bring a, a Lewis into service, there's the, um, there's the uh, uh, application for placing in service, uh, APA service anyway. Uh, basically, uh, the Railway Safety Commissioner has to approve the introduction of any piece of railway infrastructure. So in this case as well, there's a, there's a kind of a uh, various stages of, of, of uh, approvals, you know, needed for that. So you've got, a, uh, you've got the design stage. At the design stage, the, the, the railway safety has to approve. And then really they kind of leave you alone more or less until you want to bring it into operation, really, you know. So, so until we bring it into operation, obviously, the, you know, the HSA, it's, it's all the construction safety stuff at the moment. But we have to, um, we have to um, uh, get the Railway Safety Commission's approval to bring this into service. So, be, be, uh, uh, and then, sorry, once, once it's in service, then the operator, the tram operators who's Transdev at the moment, Transdev hold what they call the safety case for the Lewis line. So, so they have to maintain it safely, if you know what I mean. So the, so the safety of it actually is, is with the operator while it's operating. But before it comes into operation, the Railway Safety Commission has to sign it off. That's, that's the way we go. Anybody else? Uh, just a couple of quick questions there on the three really to do with the, the utilities. The target cost contract, I'm just interested to know how much above the target cost it came in approximately percentage was and um, the CPOs, did you have to do CPOs for the sellers in terms of ownership? And then the, the existing utilities, did they remain in place when you did the diversions or did they, did they take them out? Um, okay, first question. For, I don't know if I can commercially say. I have a couple of bosses here. <laughs> um, Percentage-wise. Uh, Percentage-wise, I suppose. You see, the thing is, I, I, I'm not avoiding the question. It's just that there was a lot of scope added after tender stage. So if you take X and then, you know, add, you know, whatever, 40%, of scope into it, then the tender sum should have really been 40% higher. So it was, it didn't, it didn't double, but it was, it was about 50%, something like that. But you know, something like that. You know, I, I, to be honest with you, I'd have to talk to my QS. But you know, I, I, I know what the figures are. I don't want to give them out, to be honest. But uh, um, uh, so, so there was a lot of scope added in. So it wasn't a straight kind of percentage increase, if you know what I mean. So. Uh, in relation to uh, what was your second question again? The, the, the sellers. Oh yeah, yeah, we had to, yeah, we did have to CPO them. So what we did actually, as a precautionary measure, our property department at railway order stage actually referenced every building along the line. So the, the actually property, they actually referenced everybody along the line. And so what happened then was that when we did come across the seller, they'd already been ref referenced as part of the railway order. So then we issued the notice to treat, and we said we found the seller. And actually, some people got a nice little lottery pay out well not quite that, those numbers but small they got a small amount of money for a seller they didn't even know they had to be honest like so we actually when we came across the seller because obviously the seller even if it changed hands 20 times in the last 30 years it was still oh, it, the, once the property was sold all the property was sold if you know what i mean so whoever the the current owner was they got the uh the, the, we, we cpo the seller yeah and we've actually referenced them so we kind of own we own them now because because when we when we bought them we've referenced them with the property registration authority. So so we actually own those bits of the sellers that we actually infilled now, um, and then obviously CPOs for for bits and pieces of land as well. So the, yeah, there is a CPO process that we follow. Yeah, so it's like a, it's like a, a motorway in that w in that respect. 
Um, and then last question. The utilities, just the existing ones, pulled them out after? What they did was, um, um, what, what they did was the, 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 the main infrastructure, sorry, the new infrastructure that we built, obviously they're using that. The old infrastructure they've made redundant, but the actual pipes were left in the ground. So what we didn't, what we didn't do was we didn't chase every pipe kind of that became redundant off down the street to, 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 to dig it out. So, the, so there were redundant services. Any redundant services so that we come across as, the main, as part of the main infrastructure works get dug out as part of those works. So when we're, when we're digging our track out, and obviously we've made a lot of services redundant because we've moved them, um, we, we, we obviously we take those out. In relation to the cabling that was in, within the ducts, Aircom is, is a good example. They, they pull all their cables out and take them away. There might be the odd company that leave a cable here and there, and that actually can cause problems because when you open up the duct, you don't know if it's dead or alive, and you have to get the utility company back. But, um, but uh, no, uh, the redundant services we didn't dig them out. No, generally speaking, only if we had to for other works. In in one of the early slides, <coughs> excuse me, you said there'll be eight million trips per year on the new trams, yes. of which one million had previously been cars. Yeah. Does that mean seven million were previously buses? I, 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 I couldn't answer that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought I might get caught with <laughs> but because I, I actually, I couldn't, to be honest with you, I can't answer it. There's no point in me even waffling about it because uh, I, I, I've read, I, I know the business case and all that sort of stuff, but that, that traffic modeling type of thing is probably is not my area, to be honest with you. I'm sorry about that. Sorry, I can't answer that one. Um, just two questions from an operational perspective. Um, the first one, just very simply, I suppose, um, one of the main benefits of the of the cross city will be the linking up of the two lines. Yeah. Um, in terms of the the travel time, let's say from Stevens Green down to where you'd be at the point where you'd be able to connect onto the red line, how long is that going to take, and how does that compare to what it's like today with the walk-in distance? It, it 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 I suppose it'll depend on the traffic signalling timings, which aren't fully finished yet, full, fully finalised yet, but we, we reckon we've got seven or eight minutes, something like that, you know, I think you'd walk it in about 10 or 12 minutes, something like that, you know, but, but you know, so, so, but it depends on, on the traffic signal, on, on the signal timings, which aren't, as you can imagine, in city centre, they're not purely ours, they're Dublin City Councils, we have to agree them with Dublin City Council, but it's a, it's, it, it is quicker, but it, it's, it wouldn't be, you know, two minutes, you know what yep. I mean, like it's, okay. it's, it's, it's going it's gonna to be, because obviously we've shared running, in some areas as well, you know, the areas in, in, uh, are, are shared because they kind of we we can't take over the whole of Dawson Street for Lewis's if you know what I mean. Some that like we're sharing down Dawson Street, we're sharing on Nassau Street for example as well. We're segregated on Westmoreland Street though, you know. So 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 it depends as well on that. Okay, and the second question then was I suppose in terms of the the knock-on impact it'll have further down the Green Line. Let's say if you hop on at Dundrum. You're expecting now that the volume on the green line will increase because of the connections to, to the north side. Yeah. So, is there plans for increased sizes or increased capacity on, on the existing lines? There is, yeah. The, the, there's a separate project, separate from the Lewis Cross City project, called the Green Line Capacity Enhancement Project. That's that's actually a parallel project with ours. We're, as part of the Lewis Cross City project, we're buying seven trams. Uh, we're buying seven new, and they're actually going to be 50 meter trams. They're actually going to be 10 meters longer than our, than, than our existing trams. So we're going to increase capacity that way um, because we probably, in, especially in the city centre areas, we probably can't bunch too many more trams close together in terms of like, you know, frequency wise, mm -hmm. but we are increasing capacity that way. So what we're doing is uh, we're, 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 we're buying seven 50 metre trams, they're going to be called the 502 series, and um, so, so they're, we're buying them and then what we're also doing as well as part of it, the, the, the plan is that um, sorry, all the stops that we're building as part of Lewis Cross City are, are, will facilitate, you know, uh, that the longer trams. All of the stops that we built on the extension from Sandyford out to Cherrywood as well on the Green Line were built for the longer trams as well. But the bit in between Sandyford and St. Stephen's <coughs> Green, I, I mentioned at the very, very start, we're extending St. Stephen's Green platform. That's why. Um, so all of the stops between St. Stephen's Green and Sandyford will have to be extended to take the longer trams as well. So, th but that's not part of Lewis Cross City. It's it's a it's a part of a, a another. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, just before I've just a couple of housekeeping matters, but I might just call upon Owen O'Cahan, our vice chairman, to give the vote of thanks.
Thanks, Oliver. So I'd just like to thank you, Ron, first of all, for a very comprehensive and informative lecture, very clearly and cogently. Um, he's presented a very, very complex scheme. I, I wasn't aware myself that sliding in bridges and the like were part of this scheme, um, not to mention the traffic management, which I think you covered. Um, the scheme is, I mean, in all it's generally going very smoothly, considering what you're endeavouring to do here. And it's clearly been well run. I mean, from my own perspective, doing quite a lot of urban work, you've also set the bar very high owing sellers and the like and this is something now that is filtering down into other projects arising out of it i liked in particular your example of the communication strategy and your example of how you've um, presented the information so clearly to landowners because it's always a challenge to try and communicate particularly when you're impacting on their property um you also trying to run this project have no doubt um major headaches trying to deal with moving goalposts in the city centre. Um, we uh, didn't go into College Green so much, but I'm aware that there are proposals being developed in parallel for that, and managing those interfaces can't be easy for you. Now, at the same time, while you have the city centre dug up and disruption has become an accepted part of everyday life, there is an opportunity, subject to their own funding, etc., for the city council and others to capitalise and implement other changes while you're doing it. And, you know, we've still got almost years left um, before the system becomes fully operational, and it would be nice to see more of those going on. Of course, I mean, there's always going to be challenging buy-in, both internally and externally, for any such changes. You mentioned the choice of the NEC contract for the utilities works. And uh, I, this is something um, that's a significant challenge for us in the industry um, in terms of designing and constructing urban. Very difficult to specify. The fixed price strategy is difficult to implement. So I hope that, that your experience on taken on board by others. Um, it is actually being done, I'm noticing more in the semi-state sector at the minute and uh, the experience is that the contractor, because he's not going to lose money when something isn't as it was predicted to be, isn't as incentivized to cause delay, etc. I suppose overall it's heartening to see one much needed investment in Dublin's public transport network. The EU uh, recently highlighted the need for sustained and heightened investment in this network. So um, I hope the powers that be um, will take this on board and that we see more of these. Indeed, I note your colleague and CEO will be in here in two months' time presenting on TII's uh, upcoming works and vision and hope to see another eight or ten of these announced at that lecture. So, listen, overall, just to sum up, I'd like to thank you again for the excellent lecture, the excellent presentation materials, for the time you put into preparing it and presenting it. And uh, I'd invite everyone once again just to reflect that. Okay, yeah, thanks for that, Owen, and thank you again, Kieran. Um, thanks to you all for attending. We've got 25 souls here tonight, and I think there's 12 people online, so that's uh, pretty uh, reflective of the... the the um, interesting topic that it was. In terms of just diary events, our, we're, we're trying to secure a presentation on the 27th of April. Um, uh, Jacobs are going to uh, uh, investigate a matter further, but we're looking to do one on the national traffic model as it relates to regional roads. So a date for your diary for the 27th of April, usual time, half six. And then as Owen has alluded to there on the 18th of May, then for our AGM lecture, Michael and Owen has kindly agreed to pre present on the, the closing lecture of, of our year. Next year is another exciting year. Obviously, we had a very successful uh, our last year, which we may be able to rec replicate next year. But um, next year, we're also looking at uh, possibly Dublin Airport Authority in to present in September. Um, Willie Wallace is someone who's indicated in the past he would present for us. And then, of course, he got involved with takeovers and the stuff and the other to do with uh, Aer Lingus and whatnot. So I think his, his agenda...
We're still hopeful that he might come and present to us next year. And by all means, if you have, have any ideas or identify any kind of areas that you think that should be covered as part of this forum, please let myself or Oliver or Owen uh, uh, or Carol know. So uh, apart from that, thank you all for coming. And if you wouldn't mind, just passing on your thanks again to Kieran. Okay.